In our day-to-day -day life, we often wonder where we are. And I don't just mean where you are in your city, or your home state, or your country, but I mean where your lives fit into the bigger picture. Where you fit into world history, and where you are in the universe. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. Tyler isn't here today, so it's just going to be me explaining where we are in the universe, what time period we're in. So I think we need to get some obvious things out of the way. For one, if you're listening to this, you're probably in either the state of California or the state of Nevada, which are both in the United States. However, the time period is what I want to focus on first. Now, the year is 2016, if you're watching this when it first aired, and specifically, it's the end of 2016. December 2016. Although, what does the number 2016 really mean? Well, it means something specific to the Gregorian calendar, which is the name of the calendar that the Western world, and most of the world in fact, has adopted. 2016 means that it's been 2016 years since the calendar began, which the start is defined as Anno Domini, which in Latin means the year of our Lord. It's when people thought that Jesus was born. Now, modern scholars have moved back that date. Most people think that it's probably around 4 BC that Jesus was born. BC stands for before Christ, whereas AD stands for Anno Domini, as I mentioned. The interesting thing about this calendar is that there is no year zero. When you're counting on the calendar, it goes 2 BC, 1 BC, 1 AD. Now, this can make determining how far things are in the past a little confusing. For example, someone who was born in 5 BC and lived to 50 AD wouldn't be 55 years old. They would be 54. Now, of course, this isn't the only calendar that's been proposed. It's just the one that we've adopted. One calendar that slightly modifies this Gregorian calendar is called the Holocene calendar. It's named that way because it wants to it, it seeks to detail how many years it's been since humans first started civilizing and first started changing their environment in a radical way that separated them from the animals. And this era has been called the Holocene. Now, the only modification that the Holocene calendar makes to the current Anno Domini Gregorian calendar is that it adds a 1 to the beginning. This means that we'd be in the year 12,016 instead of 2016. At this point, I'm going to stop talking about things in terms of calendars, because our calendars are good at marking specific years, but I'm going to start going into natural history. What occurred before, what occurred before we were able to have accurate timekeeping, or indeed before humans even existed. So the first evidence of humans appeared just a few million years ago. And the first evidence for mammals appeared about 200 million years ago. Now, all the complex life you see on Earth had to have evolved from a common ancestor which spawned out of the Cambrian explosion. This was an event that radically altered the diversity of life on Earth as we know it. Before the Cambrian explosion, about 450 million years ago, all of the life on Earth, on Earth was simple it was unicellular, bacteria, archaea. It didn't have any nervous system. It didn't have any digestive processes. This all changed during the Cambrian explosion when the animal life, the multicellular life, and everything that us day-to-day -day humans consider life began to really evolve. Now, of course, the first life was far longer ago than the first multicellular life. In fact, the first single-celled life form probably spawned about 4 billion years ago from today. And before that, the first evidence of water on Earth was about 4.3 billion years ago. The Earth itself is 4.54 billion years ago, and it formed out of a proto-solar system, the same one in which all of the other planets were formed, and I will talk about the planets later because we do reside within the solar system. At this point, you're probably wondering, if the Earth is 4.54 billion years old, then how old is the universe? Now, the universe is about three times the age of the Earth. In fact, it's 
13.8 billion years old, according to the most recent estimate by NASA. There is a margin of error of about 21 million years, but we have it to a lot of precision. 21 million years might sound like a lot, but in comparison to the number 13.8 billion, we actually have the number quite precise. Now, when discussing these large numbers, such as 13.8 billion, it's often very easy for us as humans to forget about how long these uh, time scales are. And I think later in the episode, I'll be talking about distances, and it'll often be easy to forget how large these distances and how long these durations of time really are. So I think one comparison put it, puts it pretty well. If you converted the entire length of the universe, its entire history, 13.8 billion years, onto a single year, that would mean that January and all the months on this calendar were one twelfth of the entire length of the universe, and one day on this calendar was one part in 365. Then if you put a human on this calendar, just a single human that lived for 80 years, which is the average lifespan, then this human would live for less than a fifth of a second on the year. So that would mean that out of the millions of seconds on this calendar that enumerate the length of the universe, a single human occupies less than one-fifth of a second. Now if that isn't enough for you, then I think I'm going to start talking about places. And here's where it gets a little more interesting. So. The states that we are in right now, California or Nevada, those are two states in a country with 50. That's probably not new information for you, but it might be new information how many countries there are in the world. We are in the United States, but according to some people, there are about 196 countries. Now, in the United Nations, which is somewhat of an authority on the nations of the world, there are 193. However, there are some nations that are considered to be countries but aren't in the United Nations. This all depends on who you consider to be independent. For example, Taiwan is considered independent by, no, by most people, but internationally, it's not considered independent by most members of the United Nations. Of course, I'm only talking about politics on our own world, Earth, which is one of eight planets in the solar system. Now, I didn't say nine, which is probably going to cause some disagreement among the people listening, but I will get back to why Pluto is not considered a planet by most official standards now. It used to be, but that was because it was discovered in a time in which scientists didn't know a lot about the evolution, formation, and existence of planets. Now we know about exoplanets. But first, I need to talk about our own solar system. The sun is in the middle of the solar system. It's at the very epicenter, not only just in terms of gravity, but everything is, sits around the sun. Everything is gravitationally bound to the sun. And for a good reason. The sun contains 99.86% of the mass in the solar system. That means that if you chose a thousand atoms at random in the solar system, 999 of them are statistically going to be part of the sun, and just one of them are, is going to be part of the planets, most likely Jupiter, because Jupiter is the biggest planet. But first, let's talk about Mercury, which is closest to the sun. Now, Mercury is like our moon, in the sense that it's tidally locked with the sun. That means that one part of Mercury is always facing the sun, and the other part is always not facing the sun. Now this can lead to some confusion when people first start to learn about Mercury, and that is because Mercury can have some of the lowest temperatures in the inner solar system. This is because Mercury does not have a stable atmosphere. It has a very weak atmosphere, but it's an atmosphere that is not able to hold temperatures as well as the atmosphere on Earth does. On Earth, the temperature on the side that's not facing the sun, the one side that's at night, is far colder than the side that is facing the sun, the side that, at, that is at day. But on Mercury, this effect is much stronger because there is no atmosphere. And so temperatures on the side of Mercury that are not facing the sun and thus never see the sun because Mercury is tidally locked can reach temperatures hundreds of degrees below zero, 
and the side that is facing the sun, the side that has day, can reach temperatures of hundreds of degrees above zero. However, even though Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, it doesn't have the hottest temperatures in the solar system. Venus would have to take that title. Now, unlike Mercury, Venus has a very thick atmosphere. It has a th far thicker atmosphere than Earth does, and its atmosphere is mainly sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide. Now, the interesting thing about Venus's atmosphere is that it has a runaway greenhouse effect reaction. This is similar to on Earth, how different compositions in the atmosphere can lead to different temperatures. However, on Earth, this effect is once again not as strong. On Earth, the difference of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere can at most change the temperature of Earth by a few degrees. But on Venus, we have the opposite. On Venus, because there has been this runaway greenhouse reaction for millions of years, the temperatures there are hot enough to melt metal. In fact, we have sent a Russian probe to Venus. It landed on Venus and took pictures. However, even though the probe had a heat shield and thus was designed explicitly to withstand such extreme temperatures, it still melted and was malfunctioning after just a few hours of use. Now, of course, the third planet from the sun is Earth, and I don't think I need to talk about it much because all of my listeners, as far as I know, live on Earth. But Mars is the next planet, and this planet is between the size of Mercury and Venus. It's about the third the mass of Earth, and it's the most likely next candidate for life in the solar system. That's because although it differs from Earth in radically distinct ways, such as being far smaller, such as having no liquid oceans, such as having almost no running water, until we found out recently that, of course, it did have a bit of running water in the summer, Mars is the most likely candidate for life because it used to have oceans, and it, and it has caps, it has polar caps just like Earth does. However, it's far colder than Earth is, with temperatures on average being about a few degrees below what we can consider freezing cold temperatures here. Now, Mars might have running water under its surface, and one of the landers, the Viking landers in the 70s, they discovered preliminary evidence that there might be life on Mars, which has since been almost discredited. However, there isn't enough evidence to determine whether there really is or not, because humans have never gone to Mars. Now, I think I want to explore a little bit more about the Viking landers and what they found. They did a little experiment where they took some of the Martian soil and put water on the soil. And they tried to see whether there were any bubbles rising from the Martian soil. Presumably, this would hint at the creation of carbon dioxide as a waste product from life on Mars. And they did see some bubbles. Then they boiled the water, and after it sufficiently cooled down, they tried to see whether there were still bubbles. If they hadn't seen bubbles, this would imply in their eyes that the life had been killed but they hadn't seen bubbles. But, of course, later, after much speculation and hype, people had come up with chemical hypotheses for why boiling the soil on Mars could have resulted in such a result that they saw. And this, at this point, I want to end Mars. But right now, we're just halfway through the solar system. And this part of the solar system that we just went through is called the terrestrial planets and it's part of the inner solar system. It's the planets that are most close to the sun and are far closer to the sun than any of the other planets. However, the interesting thing about the inner planets is that they're all much smaller than the outer planets. And they're separated by a band of asteroids called the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt contains hundreds of millions of small objects. However, because of the vast scale of the solar system, you can't see the asteroid belt as if it's often shown in movies, as a, as a whole bunch of asteroids strewn about almost like a mat. 
In fact, the asteroid belt is more of a statistical area for where you might find asteroids than it is an actual belt that you could see with a telescope or your eye. Now, the largest planet of the solar system is next, and it's Jupiter. Jupiter has a very complex atmosphere. It's very rich in different substances, but is mostly made of hydrogen. Not only is it the most massive planet in our solar system, but it has more moons than any other planet. The last I checked, there were about 69 moons of Jupiter, but one gets discovered about every year or so, so don't be surprised if there are 70 or more moons by the time you hear about this. One of the things about Jupiter, and one of the first things that was noted about Jupiter, was its great red spot. It has one section in its lower hemisphere that is an eternal storm, or seemingly an eternal storm. You see, the person who had first witnessed the, this red spot on Jupiter, Kepler, he had noticed it to be about one-third the size of the planet, meaning that it had taken up one-third of the lower hemisphere. And nowadays, the, the red spot is a lot smaller. It's about the size of Earth. Now, it's possible that Kepler was merely exaggerating the size of this, but we have seen over the last 100 years that the red spot has dwindled. And within the next few hundred years, we are expecting that it will either continue to dwindle or completely disappear entirely. But right now, there's not enough evidence to say either way. Now, it's often said that Saturn has the rings of the solar system, and this is true. The rings of Saturn are the most complex and dazzling of any other planet in the solar system, but Jupiter also has some rings. They're just not quite as visible by telescope as the rings of Saturn. And speaking of Saturn, Saturn is the second most massive planet in the solar system, but probably the most beautiful, and it has a very interesting moon. The moon of Titan is one of the places in which we think life might exist. And the reason why we think this is because it has complex volcanic activity. It has oceans, although these are just oceans of methane. And its thick atmosphere has made it speculative. It's made it confusing because we can't really see the surface by just a telescope. However, we have landed on Titan, which was the only landing that we've ever done in the outer solar system. This was performed by the Cassini mission, which is part of the European Space Agency. You can look at a video online, but they have a single image of the surface of Titan, and it looks alien. Of course, there's just rocks, but they are rounded rocks, meaning that there's flowing methane, meaning that rocks could have been rounded over time which in turn means that it might not be too much separate from Earth. At this point, the next planet in this solar system is Uranus. Now, I think one of the most interesting things about Uranus is just that its name is the most controversial part of the planet, and I think that's for an obvious reason, so I don't think I'll get into it in this. But the reason also that this planet is so bizarre is that it almost looks like a, a featureless spheroid. When you look at it through a telescope, it's completely gray or slightly purplish, and it looks like an ordinary sphere. Absolutely no features about it, absolutely no mountains, no valleys, no running water, no rivers, no lakes, no oceans, no atmosphere. Well, there is an atmosphere, but you can't see the storms of the atmosphere by just looking at the surface. It just looks like almost a computer model of a simple sphere. And Neptune is the last and farthest planet out in the solar system, and it's slightly less massive than Uranus. And the interesting part about Neptune is that it's very similar to Uranus, but it does have some features. You can see storms, and it's much bluer than Uranus is. Both Uranus and Neptune are so far out that we call them ice giants. This means that they are so cold that the elements that are on their surface are almost completely ice because they can almost not see the sun at all. It's very faint from the surface of Neptune. But the sun would be even more faint from the dwarf planets which lie beyond Neptune. The first dwarf planet and closest dwarf planet to us is Pluto. Pluto is 
or was a planet, but is now considered a dwarf planet. And this is because of the official definition of a planet by the International Astronomical Union. Now, the conditions that one must abide by to be a planet is that you must orbit the sun, for one, you must be large enough to round yourself by your own gravity, and thus far Pluto is a planet, but there is a third condition that they added in 2006, which is that you must clear the neighborhood, which means there must not be significant debris in which the planet was not able to capture because it is not massive enough. Now, the specific belt that I'm talking about, much like the asteroid belt, except the asteroid belt is between two planets, the specific belt that I'm talking about that Pluto was not able to clear is called the Kuiper Belt. And also, there are some other dwarf planets within the Kuiper Belt. In fact, there's a more massive planet than Pluto that was only discovered a decade ago called Eris. And there's a planet called Makemake and Haumea. Now, these dwarf planets are not as well known as the Inner Eight. But even less known are the planets outside of our solar system. Now, I said the definition of a planet was something that orbited the sun, for one. But a planet that is outside of our solar system is called an exoplanet, and these orbit other stars. The closest solar system to us, which is Alpha Centauri, does have a single planet to our knowledge, and it is about the same size of Earth but it probably doesn't contain life because it is tidally locked and much like Mercury, it doesn't have a very good atmosphere for being able to support such things as life. Now moving beyond the solar system, we have the entire galaxy. Now the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, the Milky Way, and to put that in some type of perspective, each light year is about 5.9 trillion miles across. Now, a million miles is larger than between here and the moon, but if you multiply that number by another 5.9 million, you have arrived at a light here. Then if you multiply that number again by 100,000, you have finally reached the number and the length of our Milky Way. At the center of our Milky Way, and indeed at, most, at the centers of most galaxies is a black hole. The black hole at the center of the Milky Way is called Sagittarius A. And the closest galaxy to the Milky Way is the Andromeda Galaxy. Together with the Andromeda Galaxy and a few other galactic fragments that are around the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, that makes up our local group. However, our local group is but a small fraction of the entire universe. In fact, our local group is in what's called the Virgo supercluster, which is one of about 10 million superclusters in the observable universe. And the supercluster itself is 110 million light years across, over 1,000 times the distance of our own galaxy. And the observable universe is an entire beast altogether. Its size is baffling, and I think numbers won't really get across how large it truly is but it is 93 billion light years across. And that's not even to mention that our observable universe is simply the sphere that surrounds us, that it's theoretically possible for us to observe. The entire universe as a whole is likely infinite or at least a few hundred times larger than the observable universe that we can witness. Now, I think that concludes the episode, and I hope I kind of inspired you to not just think about the little things in life, but to consider that you're part of one massive supercluster, the observable universe. Everything around you is much larger than you probably thought. This has been What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. Goodbye.